So, welcome to our virtual um, field day for the grasslands. This is um, what COVID has brought us to, so that's all right because we're lucky enough to be out here today. But um, we're here at Peter and Jenny Hinchliffe's farm just south of Ararat in what I think I can boldly say is one of the most spectacular grasslands I have ever come across. And I, I think I'm pretty sure Ben would concur with that. Um, we will take you around to have a look at some of the incredible species. But just very quickly from me, the way we, um, well, I first met Peter and Jenny, I think back in the caring for our country days when, when they discovered a little grassland site. But Pete might talk a little bit about that. But our involvement with Pete and Jenny now is they are involved in round three of the Victorian Volcanic Plains Stewardship Program, which is uh, incentives that the CMA provides to private landholders to protect critically endangered ecological communities. So this one being natural temperate grasslands of the VVP. And um, so what we do, we come and assess sites and determine if they're good quality, excellent quality, and have different lengths of agreements um, that farmers opt for, um, conservation covenants being the sort of the top shelf. So, and that's what these guys have gone for, which is spectacular for this site. And um, and this this is a, an NLP, so a national land care funded program through the Australian government um, funding program. So I think rather than me talking anymore, I'm going to hand over to Peter and Jenny to give a bit of a, a background on what they do um, and, and just, you know, sort of talk a little bit about their farming and um, what they've been doing with this site. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, uh, welcome everybody here to our um, little grassland and woodland land site here. Um, it's pretty unique with what we've got here. Um, I'm a fifth generation primary producer in the Lingy Logan district. We grow fine wool with a self replacing merino flock and grow canola, wheat, and barley in rotation with pasture. We're right on the northern end of the Grampians um, vol volcanic plains, sorry, the Victorian volcanic plains. I took up lease here in 2010 and run weathers on the block. Um, not very heavy because it doesn't doesn't carry a lot of sheep but I've worked out we sort of carry about four DSC rotationally over the block. Um, the previous owner of this, if I go on a little bit of history, um, this land was broken up in the 1860s when they divided up the stations and the Carrolls were the people that took on this country. The Carrolls were bridge engineers and road builders. They weren't really farmers. And they took up this block, which was their base, where they ran draft horses, grew fodder, and lived on this block, and later bought land down Lengi Logan, where they, another generation, the later generation, did farming. So this block was never really intensely farmed. It was more of a sort of a block where they looked after their horses and their base camp was for the engineering business. Um, the last bloke that farmed here had land around Lengi Logue and he didn't have anybody to succession the farm onto and he slowly sold off parcels of land and I acquired this as one of his last blocks. Um, I got to know him through wool classing and this is where I got attached to the block. I first met up with Aggie with the CMA with a small grassland area I had at home at Lengi Logan and that's what really got me involved with native flowers and wildlife and it's just taken on from there. Yeah, pretty good. So pretty unique, it's just, it's not attached to our main farm. Um, we can come in here and wander around and just get lost in it, it's just amazing. The views are good. Uh, it's just so good. Um, we rotationally graze the sheep around in all the selected selected little paddocks here and just look after it. That's pretty well what we're doing, yeah. That's about all for now. I'll yeah. add a bit more. Can I? Yeah. Pete, can you maybe... I remember when you had first bought this block 
you came to St Enoch's to a, a grassland monitoring yeah. field day and you had a whole lot of photos and, and you said, I've, I've bought this block. There's all this stuff that looks really interesting, but I don't know what it is. I think it was Brad Farmelow had a look and, and, and I sort of used Brad as a bit of a monitor. He got super excited. So I was like, wow, this must be something incredible. And, um, and I think something that really amazed me, having worked with farmers for a long time on the volcanic plains and, um, you know, sometimes really trying hard to persuade people to protect something to the other end of the extreme, people knowing and totally understanding the value of what they had and, and knowing that they could get a lot of money for it. But then sort of along came you sort of talking about buying this farm and just saying, I think it's got special stuff on it, but I don't know, but I just want to run some weathers. And mm. and then we came out and I think I was sort of just getting to the end of my program. So I had no money to offer you, but just thinking, oh God, what can we do? And then finally it was when Ben and I got to come out at the start of NLP2 and it was just incredible what we saw. So for from a, a CMA point of view, having someone who just so willingly will, you know, know that knowing that you can't push this land and you can't turn it over and you can't, you know, you know, raise prime lambs on here, but willing to take it on anyway and knowing that you can farm and still grow good wool but maintain the grasslands, that's just that's an ideal for us. So um I think that's pretty amazing combination. Oh yeah good fine wool country I suppose but it doesn't carry many sheep but I think the weathers that I brought into here I think they were the first sheep that I ever had that uh, were over 50 newtons per kilotech strength in the wool it was just amazing and um, yeah just 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 so good um, yeah mm -hmm. good. Um, yeah have, have you had any challenges so I mean obviously like I, I know Liz's doing some pan shots and we're seeing this isn't and having just driven up possibly one of the scariest hills <laughs> its access isn't amazing um we know that yes yeah there is something a great gate just there but but it's not fantastic access i mean it wouldn't be easy to to come and you know improve this country anyway dare i use that term but um and putting lots of fence up i mean were there what were the sort of challenges like water you know what where are you going to put fences are you going to put fences up were, were there sort of things where you just scratch your heads and went how how are we going to make this you know economically viable but keep looking after the the grasslands um i think i'm just i've re-fenced what fences were originally here which were sort of fallen down but i've, I've fenced it to the types of um, areas that are here. There are three paddocks on the block that are arable country that he had chair farmed years ago and they, there was no wildflowers or native grasses on them at all. But the hill country, obviously you can't crop it or anything. It's just probably no fertiliser history and it's just the way it is. And when I saw the way it was, it was just so unique. I had to protect it the way it was. So I've I virtually just fenced it the same as what it was and now I can control where the sheep go with the tree grazing and and just, just keep an eye on it. Um, I'm letting the wildflowers get away in the summertime and I probably haven't got water up on that part of the property but I don't need it that time of the year because I want the flowers and the grasses to do what they've got to do and then after they've done that I can put sheep on here in you know January, February. Um, the three paddocks that, that um, were share farmed years ago, we've got a program there where we're trying to bring them back into production and get some permanent pastures going there. So they're in crop at the moment and we'll just we'll treat it as two, two properties, I think, um, and just use the shape of the tool to do weed control and maintain this unique area as what it is. Mm -hmm. um, Pest-wise, there's not too many pests in here. I know we can't call the kangaroo pests, but there's over 300 kangaroos come in here at night at certain times. They're, they're pretty um, thick in here. Um, they're getting thinner though. Uh, full credit goes to the previous owner. He spent a lot of time. He never owned a tractor, but he spent a lot of time with a hoe here and he just kept all the thistles down. He never used chemicals and he just kept the rabbits down and he just looked after it so well. Full credit goes to, goes to Huey for what he did.
Um, and that's why it's what it is, and I want to keep it that way, if I can. Yeah. Mm. That's good. Now, I mentioned before in my little intro about the different types of agreements the CMA sort of had on offer. One of them was about the length of agreement, and and you guys opted for permanent protection yep. via a conservation um, covenant through Trust for Nature. Can you tell us maybe a little bit? No. No. What? I'm only just getting into into it. And yeah. I'm going through. Yeah, but I'm sort of reading through it. Yeah. But yeah. I think the trust for nature is a good permanent protection that this needs preserving forever. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we'll just work on it and, and look after it. Mm. I good suppose on. I first came out to this site with Aggie a couple of years ago where we spent a couple of days just walking across the whole site and putting together a bit of a species list and we recorded probably over 180 species in that time and then just today we're finding more species that we didn't see last time so the reality is there's probably way more species than we originally thought and so to get native grassland on this scale on the volcanic plains I just didn't think we'd of this quality as well I just didn't think these type of sites existed anymore so what we're seeing here is sort of 50 hectares of what is pretty similar to the best grasslands we see on the road sites. Um, and it's, it's probably because of that unique history that this site has had that Pete was talking about uh, that's enabled a lot of the diversity to hold on here, um, which is light grazing. It's, there's patches of kangaroo grass here on the other side, but it's more a, um, a astrostiper, speargrass dominated grassland. So it's probably not so much important with fire. You can probably manage these systems a bit more easily with light grazing. And we don't see that build up a biomass here. Um, so the, the current management regime of just light grazing with sheep has done a really good job at, at preserving the site's diversity. Um, yeah. And Aggie's got... So, so what, are, what are some of the plants we've got here, Aggie? So we've, we've got the Bacardia umbellata, so the milkmaids here. And these have been going absolutely gangbusters this year. So just a little lily, just with a couple of little leaves. We've got lots of chocolate lily here. And just, yeah, in a little random patch of, and this is in some of the best stuff, but we've got sundews here, we've got little solongonies, we've got the gonocarpus, we've got kangaroo grass, spear grass, all of these um, sheenus, all of these solongonies, all of these, some caesia. Heaps of native species on really small scales, and this is just spread out across about 50 hectares here. And then little orchids. Yep, we've got the a leaf for a sun orchid, Ethelimitra, and we've got a microceris, so an onion orchid here. And when you get your eye in, these onion orchids are just everywhere. You look around, but if we just have a little wand around, we've got um just back. Here, rice flowers, so primelia, the drosseras, which are the, um, I'm having a complete mental blank, what we're having. The sun juice, so that <laughs> would be juice. probably, it's got little hairy sepals on it, it'd be drossera hookeri, so hookeri. it's a little carnivorous native plant. Uh, we've also got a lot, not so much here, oh, it's a little bit over there, we've got the, the trigger trigger plants, the stylidiums, which you don't see much on the volcanic plains, um, but there's a lot of those across this site. That's a huge chocolate lily. <laughs> Here we've got a patch of our, um, our trigger plants here. So you can see these plants, I've got a little, a little trigger arm on them so if the, as the insects sit on the flower, that arm will slap down on top of the insect and slap it with pollen and that's what helps to spread pollen between the flowers. I don't know if any of these have been, a lot of them have already been set off. Are there any there that are ready to go? Probably a bit hard to catch on the camera. These ones, oh, that, that one just went there. Yeah. Should we be naughty and trigger one off? <laughs> go for it. Can we do that? <laughs> okay, here you go, Liz. Can you do it? Yeah, yeah, it's 
It's loosened off, it's a bit, a bit stuck. It is a bit stuck. This is totally tampering with nature, isn't it? <laughs> Here, I'll try this one. There we go. You get that? And it will just reset itself after a bit. Yep, they do reset. And then, um, and here we go, not so many here, do we? Oh, oh, here we go, we've got some um, gardenia over there. Gardenias, yep. Yep. And the Brenonia, Brenonias. Australis, down here. It's and then we get, get into um, the heath. Some heaths, heaths yep. Which type of heath? The uh, it could be Styphilia, that one. Mm -hmm. Very spiky leaved. Mm. Yeah, some really nice Gordinias over here. Well, here we go. I've never seen so many lizards in the one area. They're just, it's just lizards everywhere. Oh, nice. yeah. A couple of stumpy tails. Stumpy tails, yeah. yeah. They're the only only ones I've seen, like the stumpies. I've never seen any other types. Yeah. And I've never seen a snake in here in all the years. But oh, yeah. yeah, lizards are they're everywhere. Oh, wow. So I think they're paired up, maybe. Because yeah. I've just seen them in pairs. Do you guys have a... Do you guys have a favourite plant here? Oh, I think they're all special eggy. Yeah. Just, just so good to see them all the time. But you wander off with another mm -hmm. certain one and you just you find a different one every time. And the mm. phone gets flat batteries because it's just full of photos of the plants, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just that's why it's so special. You just wander off and every week it changes. It's just something different. And then you come across the lizards and... Um, I think there's a couple of echidnas in here too because there's a couple of ant nests you see dug out every now and then. I've seen a couple wandering around, so yeah. Good little habitat yep. for those guys. Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, we could easily spend all day <laughs> wandering around here and, and we could well once the camera stopped rolling but um but we will sign off here but um as i said at the start this is a replacement for a um what we were hoping would be a nice film field day but um hopefully things will be a bit different in 2021 and we can actually get out here and you guys can get out here and enjoy this in the flesh like we are but i'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much to peter and jenny for one giving us us their time today but um for just being so incredibly dedicated and passionate to this program and and loving grasslands um i think sometimes i think i might be one of, you know ben and i might be you know just this rare species who love these things but it's just so special to know that there are actually farmers who have got this stuff and are looking after it so thank you very much from us and um and we'll see you you know with everyone hopefully a busload of people here next year So we are here at Peter and Jenny's. This is one of the sites um, we, we assessed the entire block here, didn't we? Uh, back uh, two two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. Yeah, and um, and this this particular area, this presented a few um, interesting challenges because behind me you'll sort of notice a few holes, and these were the the old mining holes. Um, and Pete will be able to tell us more about what these mining holes are. Yeah, well, I think back in the mining days in the early 1860s or before 1860, they, they had a bit of a dig around here and it was the start of one of the leads, I think, um, back in those earlier days and the holes have always stayed and they've been a bit of a nuisance and I did some land 
care work down below where we had some erosion and tidied all that up and then we looked at this and we thought oh the bulldozer driver was keen to level this area off and I said no hang on a minute we we might leave it for a year or two and see what happens and um, since we've joined the CMA Aggie's come on board and got me to fence it off and it's a lot easier to manage I can graze it out and I've got all these plants everywhere it's just amazing there you go. thank you so the the thing that really got Ben and I excited about this was I mean it, it's incredible grassland around us but comparatively speaking it's you know it sort of didn't get the highest ranking but um the the difference like the little sort of aquatic ecosystems in here but then Pete and Jenny just very recently discovered this um glycine latrobiana the clover glycine which is a critically endangered um pea which we don't find I think I could count on one hand the number of sites that we have this plant on so this is really special one but um you can just see here like all the the leptorhynchus squamatus and there's just so many lilies flowering and I mean even the drosera like the sundews here this this site's just I suppose it's from what we thought was sort of a bit of a safety thing just fencing this off so Peter Jenny didn't drive into it you know accidentally on the motorbike when the grass was long to now it's just fencing it and giving it a quick graze in July has been the best thing for it.